This is my Bible. It is the Word of God and the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am. I'm seated right now in the heavenly realms in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine, and I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert, my spirit is receptive, as I am taught the Word of God, my life is changed for the better, and I will never be the same again. Amen. You may be seated. Well, today is a special Sunday. It's Christmas Communion Sunday. And many times when we have a Sunday where we receive communion, just because of the time, the time constraints, we often don't have enough time to give proper instruction about communion and receiving from the Lord's table. But today is a special day, and so we have the time. If you would turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 17. The church at Corinth was a church that the Apostle Paul had spent much time in, mentoring them and training them. And so they were very near and dear to his heart. But it was also a church that had many problems and many issues. We find that out in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Corinth was a cosmopolitan city. You know, if you were to try and compare it to a modern American city, we might compare it to Las Vegas, wealthy, affluent, but a lot of promiscuity, a lot of immorality. And so this is where this church was at in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 17. Paul writes, in the following directives, I have no praise for you. So he's saying, I, I don't have anything positive, anything nice, anything good to say. For your meetings do more harm than good. Man, that, that should never be true of us anytime we gathered together. And we find out from the New Testament that when we gather together and meet, we ought to be taught the Word of God. We ought to be exhorted. We ought to be encouraged. And if, if there is some guidance and correction, it ought to be done in love. And so he tells them, your meetings do more harm than good. Verse 18, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. You know, when people tell us things, we always take it with a grain of salt. And so he, he adds that caveat there. But he has already, in 1 Corinthians prior to this, mentioned divisions. There's bickering. There's fighting. There's strife going on. And that's not who we should be as the body of Christ. Elsewhere, he talks about how we're the body of Christ. And every part of the body is important. You know, this morning before the first service, I dropped off Samuel to Children's Church. And so whoever's the teacher back there, whoever's working back there, you know, if my perspective is they're doing something very important today. They're teaching those children the Word of God while we're here in the adult service. They're a part of the body. And so what they're doing is so important. There ought not be fighting. There ought not be bickering. There ought not be division. Some in the church said things like, well, I follow Paul. Some said, I follow Apollos. I follow this guy. I'm, I follow that guy. You know, Paul said it this way, follow me as I follow Christ. If we're to say I'm following anybody, we should be talking about the fact that we're following Jesus Christ. That's who we're following. That's who we're living for. That's who we're imitating. So there were divisions, fighting, bickering, strife. Verse 19, no doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. And that always makes us uneasy, but the reality is if you have people that have been living faithfully for God five years, 10 years, 15 years, there's going to be things in their life that stand out and are different in their life than maybe somebody who just got saved a week ago or a month ago or six months ago, and that's all right. There are, there are differences but as the body of Christ, when we gather together, we should gather together in unity, exhorting one another, encouraging one another, cheering each other on. Instead of sticking our foot out to trip each other, our attitude ought to be we're, we're helping each other. We're encouraging each other. You know, and if we have a, a comment to make, let's make it a positive comment. Amen. Amen. 
you know, not all criticism is bad, but there's a difference between destructive criticism and what's called constructive criticism. But so much of what people say is not, it's not constructive, it's destructive. Verse 20, when you come together, it is not the Lord's supper you eat. So he writes dealing with the issue of communion and how they have been treating and handling communion and the Lord's Supper. And what they would do is they, they would gather together, they would have what's called a love feast. And uh, you know, some of us, we like to eat enough already. So praise God, we don't eat a full meal every time we gather together for church. That would be a problem. And we do this occasionally. We have a guy's night. We, have, we, could, we could call it a love feast. People wouldn't understand what that was. But when we have a guy's night, we eat. And it's typically good food. You know, something like Babe's Chicken from Burleson or Mexican. We have a feast and then we hear the word of God. And so it was very common. They would have a meal and then they would partake of the Lord's table. They would partake of communion, the Lord's Supper. But what was happening is those that were wealthy, those that were affluent, those that were rich, they were getting there early. They were bringing the food, but th because they were there early and because of their affluence, they were basically eating everything, consuming everything before those that were less well off, before those that were, they were either poor or a part of the servant class before they arrived at church. And they were eating and they were consuming everything. And so this is what Paul is writing to deal with. And then in that, partaking of the Lord's table with an attitude of strife and division and not treating one another the way they should. When you come together, it is not the Lord's supper you eat, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anyone else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. And so what was happening is when the, those that were less well off, when those that were poor, in, in Rome, they had a huge servant class. When those that were a part of the servant class arrived, everything had been consumed, everything was gone. It's not right. And it's not what the body of Christ should be. Further, because in those days, you know, it's so important that, you know, we read things in context and we think when we read. It's okay to think in church. You know, in that day, in the first century, you had to be very careful about the water you drink. Timothy was a young man that was trained by Paul. Now, this past week, I read, finished reading the book of Acts again. And it's interesting that again and again, Timothy is mentioned, that he was, he was trained, he was mentored by the apostle Paul. Later, when Paul wrote to Timothy, Timothy was sick. He was sick in his stomach. He basically had what we would call a stomach bug. And the reason was because where Timothy lived, they, they, they gathered their water, their drinking supply from cisterns. What's a cistern? Well, it's where you let it rain, you let the water sit, and that's your drinking supply. But anybody knows that you run the risk of that water being contaminated and very unhealthy. And so Timothy, he had a stomach bug. And Paul wrote to him and said, gave him practical advice, Paul wrote to him and said, drink a little fermented drink. Why? Because that alcohol in that would knock that stomach bug out. But that tells us something. What does it tell us, Austin? It tells us that Paul had trained Timothy as a young man not to partake of fermented drink. That was the default. Don't touch it because it leads to sin. Don't touch it because it leads to trouble. Don't touch it because it leads to heartache. See, people many times will go to the scriptures to find this or that verse to justify their lifestyle or their sin. In the New Testament, the word oinos is used to describe fruit of the vine, which is basically grape juice, vinegar, which was offered to Jesus when he was suffering and dying on the cross, and drink that has been fermented. And people don't realize that. And so they, they go through and they cherry pick this or that to justify what they're doing that they know isn't right. And so they didn't have alternatives. You know, in Texas, we have sweet tea. But if you drink too much sweet tea, it's not good for you. There might be a lot of conviction about that this morning. If you're having trouble with pastor's weight loss challenge, it could be the sweet tea. And I know it is wonderful. Why? It's liquid sugar. 
You know, we have all of these alternatives. They didn't have alternatives. So they had water and whatever kind of supply of water it was. You know, in Laodicea, why did John in Revelation talk about the water? Well, when he mentioned water, they all knew what he was referring to because of their water supply. And so they had water, whatever type of water they had, and they had fruit of the vine or fermented drink. And so there were those among them drinking fermented drink, and they were getting drunk in the process. And it's ungodly. It is unholy. One remains hungry. Another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? You know, the cafe is for a snack. Amen. Wednesdays, there's a meal before. But he's pointing out that certain things ought to go on in the home, not at church. Do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. So how we treat one another is so important. And we, we often sabotage ourselves. The Bible says that the little foxes spoil the vine. Well, Austin, I'm praying for this. Austin, I'm believing for that. I'm confessing this. I'm saying this. Well, how are you treating other people? When you came into church this morning in part, did you do it in a spirit of love? When you, you walked in and greeted people and greeted the children's workers, what were, your, what were your interactions like? It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. And how we treat one another, how we act toward one another is so important. So he said, shall I praise you for this? The way you're treating each other, certainly not. So how, you know, this passage here is another reminder. And I know it's Christmas Sunday. Austin, I just want to hear about the birth of Christ. But because of what he did for us, how we live, how we represent him, how we honor him, it matters. It matters. We are representatives of Jesus Christ. And that's true here. That's true when we gather together, but that's true all during the week. Verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So when we partake of the Lord's table, when we partake of communion, it's about us gathering together in love and unity, one heart, one mind, to commemorate, to remember what Jesus did on our behalf, how he paid the price in his physical body for our sins to be forgiven and for our sicknesses to be healed and for our needs to be met. He suffered in his body. His body was broken on our behalf. And so when we gather together and partake of communion, we do that in remembrance of him. Verse 25, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, in this culture we live in, so much is done flippantly. So much is done without honor. So much is done in an attitude of disrespect. You know, people do Instagram posts about doing communion at home with Cheetos and Coca-Cola. It is frightening when you continue reading this passage. It is not something to take lightly. And you might, might say, well, Austin, you, you sound very traditional. I, I'm 35, I, I consider myself a young person but not everything that's traditional is bad. And some things are tradition for a reason, because there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And we see here also that communion is to be done together as the body in the gathering of the church and the gathering of the people of God in remembrance of him. Do this in remembrance of me. So our, our attitude ought to be one of honor. Our attitude ought to be one of reverence. Our attitude ought to be one of respect. Therefore, verse 27, here's why this matters. Here's why our attitude matters. Here's why how we treat one another matters. Verse 27, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So it's possible to receive communion in an unworthy manner, to partake of the Lord's table, in an unworthy manner. 
And so once again, this ties all back into our lives and how we're living and how we're treating one another and our attitude and whether it's an attitude of honor or dishonor. Verse 28, a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. Now, this isn't the last Sunday of 2017. That's next Sunday. But as we head towards the end of the year, th this is something for all of us in our lives to be mindful of. Not just today, not just before we receive communion, but to evaluate, to examine ourselves. And as we often say, if, if you're hearing this and your, your first response is, well, man, I, I know a lot of changes and improvements and things my brother over there and my sister over there needs to do differently, you're, you're missing it. Paul is saying we should each examine who? Ourselves. And so that's true before we receive communion today. But what better time to examine yourself than today or next Sunday before the end of 2017? What can I do better in 2018? How can I do a better job of walking in love and honoring Christ in 2018? How can I do a better job of living for God and, and doing the things for the kingdom of God in 2018? Examine yourself. And see, if we, if we would live this way, we'd all get a lot further down the road. If we would live this way, we'd all make a lot further progress spiritually. So often people get wrapped up in examining others. Jesus talked about this when he said, before you try and remove the speck of dust from your neighbor's eye, first remove the plank from your own eye. And we, we, we read plank and we think it's like a splinter or something, but the more appropriate illustration would be a, a, a plank, a log the size of a telephone pole. Before you go about worrying about the speck of dust in a neighbor's eye, take the telephone pole out of your own eye. Examine yourself. And we ought to do this in our lives on a regular basis, but especially before we receive from the Lord's table. Verse 29, forever eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment, damnation upon himself. So think about what they were doing. They were coming early. They were consuming the love feast before everyone got there in a totally unrighteous, ungodly atmosphere. Then in that, they were receiving of the Lord's table consuming it all upon themselves once again before everyone got there. Bad things are going to happen. And so Paul says when people do this, they drink judgment. They eat judgment upon themselves. Verse 30, that is why many among you are weak and sick. Some translations say sickly. And a number of you have fallen asleep. What does that mean? It means to die early, to die, to die prematurely. I love what the Bible says of David, that he fulfilled his days. We ought to all fulfill our days. We ought to all live every single day that God has for us to live. There's no reason for any of us to die early or prematurely. And we love you. And so that's why we're, we're receiving the Lord's table, reading this passage. We have the guts to tell you, if you do certain things, you'll, you'll bring judgment on yourself. You treat people a certain way. You'll bring judgment upon yourself. So how we live, it does, it does matter. And when we mistreat each other, we mistreat brothers and sisters in Christ, it opens the door to weakness. It opens the door to sickness. Now, we understand, you know, it's Texas, it's 70 degrees one day, it's 20 degrees the next, and in that atmosphere, it's easy you, you to be dressed the wrong way, to not have a jacket that's heavy enough to get a cold or whatever. We understand that. But there are also times when there are people and they're dealing with things in their life and in their body and in their home that they have brought on themselves and it is judgment. Weak, sickly. Some of you have died, fallen asleep. You have died prematurely. And we love you. This is one reason why. You know, you might wonder, well, man, why has pastor got this weight loss challenge for us? He loves us. And it's awesome. We've already crossed 1,000 pounds. That's, that is miraculous. Amen. That's one of those miracles in 2017. And you might say, it's a long way to go to 10,000. Not if everyone participates. Everybody besides the really skinny people. Amen. But pastor loves us. You read in the cafe, F.F. F. Bosworth's book on Christ the Healer, on healing. In that book, towards the end, he talks about people 
who even though God heals them, they keep dealing with things in their life and their body because they don't take care of their body. And our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he even talks in that book about people, they shorten their lives, they die prematurely because of not taking care of the body. And you keep reading on in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about how we are individually the body of Christ, the toe, the ear, whichever part we are, but you also have to see in your life, you're a part of the body of Christ. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul told the men in Corinth when they committed immorality, when they would go see the prostitutes in Corinth, they were literally joining the body of Christ to those prostitutes. So how we live matters. What we do matters. How we, how we come to church matters. The spirit in which we do it. Amen. You know, after church, Christmas communion, we shouldn't be leaving church today and see you cut somebody off in the parking lot, peel out, drive around them, roll the window down, give them the finger. Amen. Well, church is over. Now I can live however I want. No. <laughs> it matters. If we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. So we're to examine ourselves. We're to judge ourselves. We're to evaluate ourselves. That's why every day of your life, whether it's first thing in the morning, sometime during the day at night, it's so important you have that time set aside that you spend with God, reading the Word of God and praying, listening to the Holy Spirit, letting Him convict you of sin, letting Him tell you, what do you need to change? What do you need to do differently? What do you need to improve? How can you be a better husband, a better wife, a better father, a better mother, a better parent, a better employee or employer? Verse 32, when we are judged by the Lord, we're being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. You know, discipline is a bummer. I don't think anybody wakes up and says, you know, I'd love to be disciplined today. I'd love to be reprimanded today. I know our children never look forward to discipline. They always try and talk themselves out of it. But discipline is important. And there's a time and place for correction. There's a time and place for rebuke. There's a time and a place for discipline, for our good, for our benefit. Why? So we won't be lost. We won't be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together, eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. And so he says, when you come together, wait for one another. Wait till everyone arrives. And then the implication is in that love feast, that, that meal, it ought to be distributed to where everybody can enjoy it together. And then in partaking of communion, the Lord's table together, they ought to do it in a spirit of sharing and a spirit of love. You know, you don't need, we, we do the little wafers. You don't need 25 wafers today. Everybody gets one, amen. The little foxes, spoil the vine. The majors are important, but man, the minors can trip us up and mess us up. In Matthew 22, Jesus was asked, which is the greatest command? Matthew 22, beginning in verse 36, teacher, someone asked Jesus, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. And what does our Heavenly Father really want? He wants us to love Him. He wants us to love our neighbors. He wants us to walk in love. In John 13 and verse 34, Jesus said, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. You know, who's our example? Jesus. Who do we imitate? Jesus. Who do we follow? Jesus. And what's our example of love? Whose love are we to imitate? Jesus. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. See, it's not the fish on the back of the bumper that makes us a Christian. It's not the t-shirt or this or that that makes us a Christian. How do people know that we really know Jesus and walk with Jesus and are the sons and daughters of God. They know by whether or not we walk in love. And it's heartbreaking reading some of these passages 
when you think about all the strife, all the division, all the bickering that goes on in the body of Christ. You know, we ought to be cheering one another on. We ought to be exhorting one another, encouraging one another, loving one another. So somebody's not your cup of tea. That's all right. You know, you're not going to be everybody's cup of tea. Everybody's not going to be your cup of tea. But we ought to be for people. We ought to be cheering them on. We ought to be wishing God's best for them. And we see something going on, something that concerns us. Instead of talking about it, we ought to pray for them. Amen. We ought to pray for them. By this, men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. This is what the New Testament calls the royal law of love. And it is the command of the New Testament. See, if we walk in love, we'll fulfill all the commands of God. All the commands of God. If somebody is walking in love, they're not going to lie. They're not going to cheat. They're not going to steal. They're not going to murder. They're not going to cheat on their husband or their wife. Why? They're walking in love. It fulfills all the commands of God, and it is the command in the New Testament. Jesus said it this way in Luke 6, 31, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, let's be honest. Do we all want to live that way 100% of the time? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Is that what you always feel like? No. Walking in love is a decision. Walking in love requires effort. It takes daily spiritual work to walk in love consistently. And praise God, you know, if we walked in love yesterday, today is a new day. Family is about to come over. Family is about to knock on your door. Those, those relatives, you get them this nice gift, they open it, and they, you, they just had this attitude like they were expecting something more or something else. You make tamales, and they wanted spaghetti instead, or whatever their problem or their issue is. You walk in love today, well, guess what's coming tomorrow? A new day. This is a decision we make every day of our lives to walk in love. You're, you're in line, you're waiting for your order, you're waiting for your coffee, whatever it is. You're, you're somewhere doing your, your order pickup and it's taken forever. You know, I was somewhere the other day. I mean, you shouldn't sell coffee if you don't know how to ring, ring somebody up for them to buy a coffee. It's not time to open yet. It was after 5 a.m. prayer, I went, got a coffee down the road. I won't say where. They've opened up. They shouldn't have opened up. They need a month of training before they open up. God bless them. Stand there, walk in love. Amen. I haven't had my coffee yet, Austin. Walk in love. Somebody cut me off on the way to work. Walk in love. You know, Satan's mean, and, and oftentimes in our lives, right when we're on the precipice of an answered prayer, right when we're on the precipice of a breakthrough, of an answer, he'll line up all of these various inconveniences, annoyances, problems to get us out of walking in love so we'll miss our blessing, we'll miss our answer, or it'll be delayed. It's a decision. It's a daily decision. Faith will not work where there is unforgiveness. You know, and I know we've got a little girl, seven, five, a new one, newborn, so I've seen Frozen way more times than I should. But that song is right. Sometimes you just got to let it go. <laughs> Faith will not work where there is unforgiveness. Let it go. Uh, we're human beings. We don't want to. We want to talk about it. We want to blog about it, tweet about it, Facebook about it. We want to put it online. We want to remind them about it. It, it's not human nature to do what Christ tells us to do. Why? Because we were born as the children of Adam with that sin nature. We don't want to walk in love. We don't want to forgive. But Jesus, he came so that we could be born again as the sons and daughters of God. You now have a new nature and you're to live like it. And so we're to forgive. Faith will not work where there is unforgiveness, grudge bearing, record keeping of wrongs, or when you're using your tongue to hurt others. James calls the tongue a world of evil set on fire by hell itself. I was always disappointed growing up whenever we would be around Kenneth Hagin Sr. because I was always expecting him to talk about the deep things of God. And even over meals, he hardly said anything. But when he was asked about that, he would always say, the less I say, the less to repent of. 
And we would do well to learn from that. See, what is sabotaging us? What is hindering us? You know, somebody could be on the, the precipice of a promotion, of a raise, but if they go in their boss's office with a bad attitude or misspeak with that tongue, they can sabotage the rest of the year. Faith will not work where the tongue is misused. Galatians 5.14, the entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. Romans 13, beginning in verse 8, Paul writes, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commands do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. You might say, well, Austin, there are people who abuse this. They lie, they cheat, they steal, they do people wrong, and then they demand others to walk in love. And that's why you've got to be discerning in your fellowship. You got to be discerning in who you do business with, who you hang out with, who you go into business with. You know, if I go somewhere and it's a terrible experience, how do I walk in love? I don't go back. You know, some places don't understand when you got kids and they're little, they want to eat right now. So the thing of bringing the salad after like 55 minutes does not work. Or, you know, letting you order the appetizer first and 20 minutes later, the no. Bring it out as fast as you can. We are here with wolves, and they are ready to eat. <laughs> you, you go buy a car somewhere, and they do you wrong? How do you, how do you walk in love? Don't go back. You go somewhere, and you, you perceive they're trying to take advantage of you or rip you off? Don't go back. You, you're around someone, and you, you just sense they're, they're not genuine. They're, they're, they're up to no good. Don't, don't hang around them. Don't invite them over. Don't, don't be anywhere near them. Avoid such people. Romans 13, 10, Paul says, love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, walking in love doesn't mean I have to do anything, but it prohibits me from doing certain things. We could say it this way, do no harm. Charles Finney defined love this way, to will and to do towards the highest good of the other. And one of the greatest hindrances to our blessings is a failure to walk in love. What hinders prayers from being answered? What hinders our blessings? Unforgiveness, strife. You know, our homes ought to be an atmosphere of peace. And I know there are times, you know, if you've been married, any length of time there's disagreement, and there are times when there are disagreements, but our homes ought to have an atmosphere of peace and love. And when you're tempted to say something you shouldn't, the best thing is to say nothing at all. Because one thing I learned early on growing up was once you say something you shouldn't, you can never take that back. You can ask somebody's forgiveness, but the words have been spoken, the seeds have been sown. In fact, scientifically, every word we've spoken, it's out there somewhere in the universe. It's sobering when you think about it. Jesus said, by our words, we'll be acquitted or by our words, we'll be condemned. We ought to walk in love. Make it your goal in 2018 to walk in greater kindness. Make it your goal in 2018 to be more gracious and more forgiving. And there are, there are times where it's easier to be gracious than other times. So this is something we've got to work on in our lives. Make it your goal in 2018 to do a better job of walking in love consistency and consistently. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And we love Mark 11, 22 through 24, but we often ignore verse 25. If you look at Mark 11, verse 25, what did Jesus say? When you stand praying, what should we do? He said elsewhere, the Sermon on the Mount, if you come to the house of God to offer an offering, before you present your offering, if you have something against a brother, or a brother has something against you, if there's an issue, if there's strife, if there's division, if there's something that's not been handled, not been dealt with, before you present your gift, first go and handle that forgiveness, whatever needs to be done, then come back, then present your gift. Mark eleven twenty five. 25, when you stand praying, 
forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. Forgive. Let it go. Put it in the hands of God. You might say, well, Austin, you don't know about so-and-so. You don't know how they did me, what they did to me, what they stole from me, how they treated me, what they said about me, what they posted about me. When you think of them or you think of what they did, pray this way. Heavenly Father, I forgive them and I bless them in Jesus' name. I forgive them and I bless them in Jesus' name. There are times during the week, I'll just be doing what I'm doing, minding my own business, and I'll think of someone. I'll think of something they did. I'll think of a situation or something they didn't finish or do, do right on. And I, I, you know, I was raised to do everything with excellence. So it ticks me off. I'll be honest. But Jessica will tell you, I, I think of certain people, if I dwell on it, it, it can foul up my day. And so when I think of them, when I'm, I'm focused, doing what I'm supposed to do, busy with what I'm supposed to do, and I, start, I think of them for whatever reason, what is that? That's Satan trying to get you distracted. Heavenly Father, I forgive them and I bless them. I put them in your hands. Let God defend you. Let God fight your battles. Let God judge them. If you want more prayers answered in 2018, do a better job of walking in love in 2018.